I hope you're all tuning in and you have an opportunity to be a part of this history that we're creating. We're developing an opportunity where we can showcase individuals, especially who have been really actively involved in developing a positive community in our neighborhoods. It is so impressive that there are individuals that have been really working hard and developing methods of being able to inspire our children and our families in ways that they can know that the encouragement is sincere and they want to continue to do it so that it can benefit as many of the people that come into their involvement. We're here today with Pastor John Gamble Jr. John H. Gamble. John H. Gamble Jr. John H. Gamble Jr. <laughs> and That's John, right. John uh, the thing that really is a blessing, and I don't find it um, a privilege um, in terms of how um, you have been able to build the kind of relationship of sincerity that mm. you have done. Wow. Um, it's, 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 it's a pleasure because you have that relationship with God. And I think people of God who are aware that God is real yes. have to submit to where God is leading you. Oh, yes. Absolutely. And you have been very um, successful in doing that. Now, I mean, you look all of 18 years old. <laughs> Not hardly. <laughs> Not hardly. And you have a very good following of people who are in the faith-based community. You have really found an opportunity where you have personified the gratitude that you have that God has blessed you with. Absolutely. But not Absolutely. so much in regard to you, but what your mission is. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Why don't you share with us the relationship that brought you to where you are. Like my dad would say, well, you know, I was really out here doing what I wanted to do, but when God called me, <laughs> oh, <Lord. laughs> what um, happened when God called you? <laughs> um, it, you know, it's just a crazy journey that I always talk about. Um, I always start um, at birth. Um, and I always tell the story. Um, one of my favorite times as a pastor is the dedication of babies. And really that is because um, I didn't have a formal dedication, um, but my dedication, the story that my mom tells me is the one that I take with me um, everywhere. And that was that in the hospital, my mother prayed over me um, and just said, you know, Lord, I don't know how to raise a child. I don't know how to take care of him. But, you know, if you help me, I will take care of him. And, I'll, and basically, I'll give him to you almost as, as Hannah talked with God about um, Samuel. And um, that that I think that might even have been where where you know, my mother had no idea what the Lord had for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I guess like that, <laughs> um, I just certainly had my moments. Um, but I mean, I grew up in church. I crawled into Jerusalem Baptist Church in Jersey City as a kid. Um, I served there my whole life. I went to church every Sunday. Um, and I loved going to church. It wasn't a, a challenge for me to go to church. But, you know, when I got older, um, you know, of course, you want to try things. You try, to, you know, and I mean, I, I tried a lot. <laughs> I don't I don't pretend about that. I tried a lot, um, including, you know, um, you know, I was always told I was kind of the innocent kid, always the kid that had it right. So I would be the perfect one to to even dabble in the, the, the drug game. And I, and I did try it. You know, I, I, I you know, I'm I'm. I'm older now, so I don't hide from some of the things that I've, I've no, done. No, you're, you're um, from the urban community? Absolutely, I'm from Jersey City. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Born and raised in Jersey City. Uh, my parents still live where I, pretty much where I grew up from the age of five, okay. five, six years old. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm from the very community I serve, which is why I'm here. Okay. Um, and so I was in college. I'll tell the story really where I knew um, God called me. Um, as I said, you know, I, I did kind of dabble in the, the drug thing in college. Um, you know, you, you try to smoke this, you try to do that. Um, I remember a friend of mine, we were driving. Um, we were stopped by the police. They said we fit the description of a group in the area. Um, mm -hmm. this, and I'm live telling the story for the first time. This is kind of cool. Um, and, you know, it was in my book bag. And I just prayed and I asked God. I was like, all right, God, you know, yeah, I, I've been out here, you know. And I was singing in the choir all the time doing this. I never stopped going to church. That's the funny <laughs> thing about it, right? Um, which lets us know that the people we serve can can really love God, but still deal with their struggles. Um, right. And so as the cops said, we fit the description of some robbery. Of course, we were, we're boys of color. This is really heavily doing the profiling time. Um, and I just prayed, even in that moment, like, all right, God, you know, I, I haven't had any other trouble, but if you get me out of this one, I'll get it together. Right. And literally the cops just asked to search the car. We were like, we can't say no, they're going to do it anyway. So we said yes. Um, and literally, they checked my bag, and it was one side pocket they didn't go in. Wow. 
Wow. And so when they so let us go, blessing. that so was the change. Answer, and that yeah. was, you know, that. And shortly after that, we went on tour. I was, like I guess I was in the choir at, at school. We went on tour. And literally, as we were at the altar praying, the Lord started to show me that, you know, the reason why I kept you is because I have a greater purpose. Wow. And um, that's that's why I've been moving, you know. Right. And I and at that time, I think I was eight. I was 18. I just turned 18. I started college at 17. I just turned 18. And I promised God, you know, I, I was not looking to preach. And even as a kid, everybody said, called me a little preacher or whatever. I was not looking <laughs> to preach, wasn't interested in it. I wanted to be a lawyer. Wow. Um, and sure enough, um, but after, as the Lord kept laying it on me, I was like, I would not let my 21st birthday come in without submitting. And um, November, November of 1996 is November when I started. That's when I did my initial sermon. Wow. Under the late John T. T. Bout. Yeah. Wow. Uh, if you're tuning in, we're at the pleasure of Reverend John H. Gamble. We're in his pastor's study, and we're doing a one-on-one -on -one with people of faith. And we're having a conversation in relationship to developing a positive opportunity to showcase people who are really in our community that are doing incredible things. And, wow, and I say you. it's incredible, <laughs> simply because of the fact that you're young and uh, the relationship of what's happening in our society, yeah. just like you say, all of us have in the urban community have had some experience with experimentation. Right. And mm -hmm. the idea of it is that some of us got away with it and some of us <laughs> did. Exactly. You know? you know, thinking about the outcome and now where you are in terms of your relationship as a principal at a school yes. and being ahead of one of the facilities of organization in the General Baptist Convention. Where do you find the pleasure of God's witness mm -hmm. the most in terms of your journey wow, to fulfill <laughs> the obligation you give um, to him? <laughs> um, it, you know what? I'm, I'm just very clear that God could have used anyone but me mm -hmm. i'm very clear um i believe you know i don't have the exact testimony of other um children i had a, an amazing mother and father that did the best they could for me with what they had they you know taught me a lot of values a lot of morals um my mother was very strict my curfew was always earlier than my friends which probably was part of the reason i acted out when i got older um but i'm still very clear that you know, that whole situation and others could have went a whole different way. I've had I've had guns pointed at me. I've been robbed at knife point. I've been jumped in fights. I, you know, all of that. I've had all of that, that urban experience. And things could have went a different way. I have friends, uh, one of my friends from Little League that literally was shot and killed in front of my house. Wow. Um, friends I went to, to high school with that are no longer here. Like, I'm very clear that God could have done something different or saw... Not that someone else could have done it. So since I have this responsibility, I'm serious about doing the best I can with it. Not that I, I do it right every day, but I'm very serious about doing the best I can with it while God has given it to me. Significantly in the relationship that you have, especially influencing young people as mm -hmm. a principal in the, high, oh, in the school yes. and as a pastor in the church, how do you find the opportunity to be able to personify your sincerity? <laughs> of what it is that you have chosen to do. Um, because I just believe that um, as I've gotten older, I've become very comfortable in who I am mm -hmm. um, and comfortable in who God is making me to be. Um, but I also know that in that, I have to be that light and that example to others. Mm -hmm. And God has just always blessed me, even as a kid, to have influence over people who are younger than me um, and the respect of those that are older than me. And um, you know, I think as I, I, I get older, I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'm not no longer the, the youth guy, but I'm, I'm still the youth guy. I can identify with with kids um, both here in the church and, and at my school. It's no different. Um, and I really just try to show them the love that I feel was given me by my parents. I treat every every child I encounter, I treat them as if they're my own child. So I have two sons, one that just turned 16 two days ago and another that's 10. Um, my thinking is always that I, I treat everybody else's child the same way I would want my own children treated. And I think that that kind of love that I have for kids, um, it transfers to them. They can see it. They can see that that I love them. I Every kid I, I come in contact with, I love that kid and I try to treat them with love. I try to treat them with respect. Um, and I try to, to be that example. And I try to always aspire for them to do better. And I'm almost like that with anyone. I mean, there, I, I mentor guys that are in their early 30s and late 20s, and usually when I come in contact with them, my thing is like, what is your five-year plan? What is your next steps? You know, what are you working on? 
and I would try to help them. Even if it's extending myself, I try to help um, them to become better. And it's not always popular. You know, I take, I take heat from it. I take comments. I take all sorts of stuff. But it doesn't stop because I'm very clear that I have had a blessed journey. Uh, three degrees. Uh, I will actually be uh, conveyed a fourth one this coming Saturday, another master's degree. Yeah. I'm a dissertation away from my doctorate. So, so I'm very blessed. I'm very driven. Um, and I believe that, you know, being an educator and, and being a preacher, I started, started them within six years, within six months, I'm sorry, apart. I started, really? yeah, it was within, mm -hmm. or yeah, or within a year apart, yeah. I should say. Um, I started in, yeah, I started November of, of, uh, 96 preaching and November of 97, it was a year apart. Um, being a minister, uh, being a, uh, a teacher, and mm -hmm. I didn't know which way I was going. I just figured maybe I'd just be, you know, an associate, or maybe I would just be a teacher, and I knew one thing, I was driven. I said, okay, you know, Lord, either um, if I, if this is what you want me to do, show me what you want me to do. Uh, either make me a principal in five years, or make me a pastor in five years. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, um, I wasn't a principal or a pastor in five years, but I was a vice principal and a pastor in 10. Wow. So, so you know, the Lord literally showed me that, okay, in my time, I'm going to elevate you in both areas because that's where I want you. You mentioned uh, the late uh, John T. Bob. Oh, yes. And uh, he was wonderful and inspiration to a number of people. A number Absolutely. Of my friends. Um, Absolutely. Encouraging the idea of where you really feel that you found your, your niche. Who was that inspiration? Oh, there's, there's so many. Um, of course, my, my parents have always been just a major, major, major supporters of my life. Um, my wife, um, she saw a teaching in me. She pushed me to become a teacher. I literally was kind of just graduated school and was like, okay, I'm going to try some ministry stuff. I help out at the church. And she was like, no, you have a degree. You need to get a job. And we, were, we weren't dating. We weren't married at the time. She's like, no, you need to get a job. You're excellent with kids. You're smart. You can, you, you have a good level of organization, try teaching, you know, and she was a teacher as well. And literally I got in and I absolutely loved it. It was challenging. Lord knows it was challenging my first year, but I um, loved it. So just in terms of my education, my parents have always been the foundation. My wife really pushed me as an educator, even to being an administrator. She always kind of helped me and stretched me and challenged me to, to be better mm -hmm. as an educator, as a preacher. Um, John T. Bott laid the foundation. Mm -hmm. um, he laid a foundation for me um, in terms of what it means to be a preacher. Um, he brought me to conferences at times. He challenged my messages. Um, he, he made me a preacher. Mm -hmm. He helped really develop my preparation, my understanding that, you know, when I stand in the pulpit, everything I do is serious. Um, and that, you know, every sermon needs to, to really be impactful. Um, I, I owe that to him. That's I really owe that to him. Right. Um, and when I, I moved on from Greater, I became a youth pastor at New Hope um, and I, an assistant pastor there. And then I have to credit uh, the late Reverend Charlie Thomas and, and certainly Reverend Joe A. Carter for mm -hmm. um, their leadership and kind of building in me the tough skin. Mm -hmm. Because at that time I had, you know, I had had kind of the the worldly experience that brought me to Christ, but in church, I, I've always been the beloved. Mm -hmm. And New Hope helped me, like he, especially Reverend Carter, because Reverend Thomas was retiring out, he kind of pushed me, and pushed against me, not mm -hmm. to believe my own press that, you know, okay, everybody loves you, but you still need work, wow. you know? You know, like, you're not all that. You know, he, he helped to, to, to focus the humility in and help me to, to learn how to, to pastor and lead and, and be a leader when things aren't comfortable for you. And so I, I owe him a lot as well. I, you know, all, all of my pastors, I can say, have really helped shape me um, to, to get to this place. And now um, it's, it's people like uh, Dr. Lester Taylor and um, Pastor G.O. Dixon and uh, Pastor uh, J. Michael Sanders from Fountain that are pushing me now to the next level as I move now to be a leader among pastors, you know, that, and still don't understand how this is happening. But hey, it's <laughs> a route branch, my, mod yeah. my current moderator, yeah. like yeah. they're the ones that are now helping me to say, okay, you know, you still have this youthful edge, you still have all of that, but then there's cer a certain level of maturity, a certain level of preparation now that you have to have because now pastors look to you, which is like, 
Yeah. Why? <laughs> well, but, you know, yeah, it's the way that yeah, they so have structured it because, yeah, yeah. you know, I've been fortunate to be as a member of Metropolitan Baptist Church to witness and understand the history yeah. of the whole involvement of the organization and the strategy and the structure and what really built the Christian education model. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. Sister Pansy King. Oh, yes, you know, yes. All, yes, all yes especially people. now yeah. at the State with Congress. Uh, she's yeah. like a sage. I, Yeah, I, I have so much respect for uh, Sister mm -hmm. King. Yeah, mm -hmm. and just... Yeah, how she looks at, at Christian Ed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how the whole involvement in that relationship really manifests to where it's at and bringing on, you know, the nuance of young ministers like yourself and others. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the thing that I did really notice in your congregation as I sat and I really witnessed on more than one occasion of your presentation and, you know, of the relationship that you have, these people here really love you. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like they, they do. I mean, I, you know, um, you know, some pastors have rough roads. I mm -hmm. can say, um, two weeks is 14 years and I cannot say that I've really had a rough, rough road. Um, Smyrna embraced me as a, as a 20 something year old preacher and gave it a shot, you know, um, gave me a shot to be their pastor. And we've just grown to love each other. You know, we, we, we can be family-ish at times, but we mm -hmm. don't always see things out of eye, but we, we fought, we, we find a way to, to work through it and, and ultimately to give God, God glory because mm -hmm. the church should be a place where we can come to give God worship in spite of our differences. Um, one of the things that I always said when I came here was, you know, we don't all worship the same, but we can worship together. Mm -hmm. um, we don't all like the same styles of, of Christian music, but we can, so we, so let's do them all mm -hmm. so everybody can find their place in God. Um, and, and that's what I try to model. And that's where, where we are. You know, when I came here, the church was a lot older, but now it's, it's mixed. I mean, we have our mothers who are kind of our worship leaders. I mean, they were the praises today, right? But then we have this young adult group now. Uh, there, there's children all throughout the church. I mean, even today wasn't a, represent, a representation of the amount of kids that attend this church. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's young, it's, it's vibrant. And, and, and yes, they love me and I love them. I love them. Mm -hmm. I love them. It's, it's really outreaching. And, and uh, the same pattern. When, when now as a, a principal yes. and in the, in the school, and this school that was modeled off of Reverend Thomas. Yes. The Marion mm -hmm. P. Thomas. Marion P. Yes. Right, we have to mention That's my baby. That, you know, yeah. Because Seven years. It, it, yeah. is, it is quite a history behind Yes, that. it is. Out of New Hope. You know, I was there when it started. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and so I develop and, you know, the nuances, the, the kinds of things that go on. The idea, and let's talk a little bit about politics, the That's charter right. and the public school Absolutely. model. Absolutely. I love it. Let's talk. And being yeah. a Christian educator. Mm -hmm. Now, wh where does this really work? <laughs> um, it's interesting because I just believe that they're both a call. And I do, um, I am, a, I'm, I'm a, interesting enough, I'm a great respecter of church and state. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there's no secret at Marion P, um, which is religiously diverse in terms of its, its student body. There's no secret that I'm, I'm, I'm a minister, I'm a pastor in the community. But I have the same level of respect um, for my Christian students as I do for my Islamic students as I do for students that may have no religious practice at all. Mm -hmm. So... Um, when I look at it, I, when I look at as the principal, that's my opportunity to practice literally what I preach. Mm -hmm. um, mm. So that very light that I talk about yeah. um, that Christians have and that sometimes we that we kind of exemplify on Sunday, Monday to Saturday is where I have to live that out. Right. Um, and, and, and in front of my students, that's where I live it out. So that the love, the love of God that I feel that like I get, I exhibit that to them. So that so um, the way I speak to them, the way I treat them. Um, you know, the parent comes in on a hundred, as we say, the way I handle them, the same nurture and care that like, to me that there, there's no, it's just, it's just the content. Mm -hmm. The content is different. So when I'm here, I'm teaching about God. I'm teaching about the Bible. I'm teaching about values and principles. There, I'm teaching about values and principles. Then I'm also teaching subject-based content, okay. but the, the left, the, the, the love, the care, the, the call, the commitment behind it, that does not change. Okay. So that's why it blends for me. It, that blends for me. So I never have to mention Jesus at work, but I do believe that people see Christ in me at work. Mm -hmm. I don't have to mention it I, because my, my testimony is not just what I say. My testimony is what I do. And you know, it's interesting. Yeah. That drives back to that statement that I made. They love you. And it's not you personally they love they love the fact that you do know god I, and, and and that's something incredible a lot of folk come to church and they don't see the true relationship the revelation mm 
that most ministers have in their relationship with God yeah. first. And it's absorbing. You know, I'll draw all men unto you is a true fact. Absolutely. You know, let's look at some other areas that mm -hmm. you've been an inspiration. You've written a book. Yes. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about what, <laughs> what inspired you to write the book. Ah, good. So um, when I wrote the book, Manhood, um, actually I was working on, I was doing some doctoral work um, and I was doing the actually on African-American boys. And mm -hmm. that, and um, so meanwhile, I've I, this is where in terms of my educational life, it gets, it gets rough because it's like, I can't do as much secularly as I do spiritually. So I always feel when I'm pushing more secularly that, wait a minute, you're, you're neglecting that, that sacred life because that's really your first calling. So in the, literally in the middle of doing my coursework for my doctorate, I kind of put the dissertation aside and said, no, I got to write this book. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I looked at sermon material. I thought about my own journey as a man and, and friends that, I, that I've had and just kind of let's rethink some of the images of what it means to be a Christian man. That is, you know, and... and and to push against even some of the kind of alpha male, traditional, archaic concepts of men, because that, the reality is that's not what we see. Right. You know, men are very different and very diverse, but there are some things about being Christian that are kind of just, that, that every man should be able to have. Every man should be able to, to show a level of vulnerability. Every man should be able to show a level of friendship. Um, every man should have a commitment to, to some level of social justice where he wants to pull his brother up. And at that time, it was very... Um, I think at the time I wrote the book, the kind of the Trayvon Martin um, incident was really kind of heavy around that time. That that kind of political tension in the country was there. So just thinking about you know the Christian men should be able to rally around what's right. right. Period. Okay. You know. So just some things like that, and it just inspired me to a write the book. Call. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was just mm -hmm. one of those interruptions in, in where I couldn't go <laughs> further until I got it done. Wow. Um, and it was rough because I told no one about it, short of, of my publisher, who's a local publisher. He was also a minister mm -hmm. um, and, a, and a friend of mine. And, you know, kind of when I announced it, it threw everyone aback. You know, wow. it, it, almost, it set my home on fire. It was like, how oh, you Lord. doing all this? You wow. know, and my past, like everybody's like, what in the world is wrong with you? But sometimes when God, you know, literally, as, as you know, sometimes God could just make you, you know, literally make you do something, push you to do something. And literally it's like, you ain't, you're not talking about it to anybody. You're going to get it done because this is what you need to do. Um, and literally, I mean, it, for me, it was almost a, a, a place of, 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 I don't say sanity, but it, it literally was a resource for me. It was an outlet for me. It was really what I needed. But more so, it was um, what God required of me. Hmm. Um, and you know, it's, cer it's certainly not the, you know, on the, the John Maxwell, Max Licato and Tony Evans level at all out. In the world, but, but the book has been used in prisons. It's been used different places um, where people have told me men's ministries about how tremendously it's blessed them. And that's exactly what my purpose was. Well, I hadn't um, had a chance to read it, but oh, you, I, was talking to, copy today. I, talking about, I was talking to Sister King, you know, we yeah. talk very frequently. And she says, well, you know, he's written a book I'm like, <laughs> and we have it in the library at the church. And I'm like, wow. wow. So those of you who don't have it in your church library, make sure you get yourself a Absolutely. copy of it because it is such an inspiration to know that there are individuals who are authoring their ideas yes. and something that can be very helpful. My grandson, he likes to go into the church library and pick out books every now and then. Wow. And I'm definitely going to steer him in that direction, let him know what's going on in that regard. You are a minister on fire. In actuality, you've created an acronym around it. Let's talk about your fire um, mis uh, uh, you <laughs> know, mission. Year, or, yeah. Um, so uh, fire this year, and I, I might have seen, I, I, I think I tweaked it, but I did see it somewhere because sometimes, you know, good stuff, you just take it and yeah. use it, right? You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Okay. Uh, faith ignites revival everywhere. So mm -hmm. just um, the importance of if you believe, it can just stir up so much potential in your life in any area of your life mm -hmm. um you know things that are dormant that are stagnant if you if you believe if you if you understand that it can happen it can literally just change your life and that's really kind of the the foundation i mean from a a, a church perspective you know we're using acts chapter two where kind of the day of pentecost and kind of how that that faith that they that they believe that they waited on the Holy Spirit kind of just ignited them to to bring salvation to ultimately three thousand people, um, but it I mean on a broader sense outside of the the revival it can ignite spiritually it faith and believing in in God and believing in what you can do can really just ignite revival anywhere in your life you know 
How many people are living with dead dreams and dead aspirations and think because they didn't go back, let's say go back to school in their 30s that that's, that they can't do it. I mean, I remember sitting in class at Rutgers with, with a husband and wife team that in their 70s mm. and they graduated. Wow. Like you can, you can always wow. push yeah. to do something if you believe yeah. you can do it. Yeah. And so that's kind of where, where my fire is. They can like literally just set your, your life on a whole different course. Um, we have been having a couple of worship type services we call Friday Fire, which are really kind of these benefit concerts with that where um, basically the church is open to, to younger talent. We're going to have one actually doing my anniversary as well. Um, to, you know, and a lot of just gifted Christian um, artists to just come and share their gift. They, they come, they don't ask for money and all of that. Um, and, you know, we, we, the money goes to different causes. Um, I plan to start a scholarship specifically devoted to African-American males in urban settings. One of the offerings I'm holding for that, um, and I plan to do some other things because that's ultimately what I want to do. I just want to be able to, in every area of my life, when my life is over, now, I'm not trying to go anywhere soon, but, <laughs> you know, I, I want to be able to say that, you know, I help people mm -hmm. and that, you know, lives are better because of my, because of my life. Because I, I, I'm... Um, of the crazy belief, you know, as a Christian that, you know, you know, people always say that, you know, times are getting worse. Times are, you know, the end days are coming. Jesus is coming back. So I've been hearing it my whole life. Mm -hmm. And my thing is, I don't know when he's coming, but as a Christian, I got to believe right. things could be, get better because that's why I serve, I work, and I minister. And I just want ultimately that when people think of me, that they realize that, you know, I was, I was a preacher, a minister, a servant that really tried to make people's lives better, whether mm -hmm. it was at a school, in a classroom, um, whether it was here at a church, whether it's out there in the community, whether some somebody's child was, you know, helped, got helped to go to college because of something that I put together. I mean, right. I literally, I mean, that that's what I do. I I, I feel it, I, and I just feel that I feel like I've been blessed enough where I'm blessed to be a blessing, and I have to be. I think it was you know? the Apostle Paul that said, you know, you don't need to be sitting around waiting on him. He's coming. Oh, yeah, he's coming. You don't be sitting around here oh, waiting yeah. on and, that, and that's my whole thing. Yeah, yeah, he's coming. <laughs> yeah, he's you coming, know, yeah. you know, we don't know when he's coming. So what? What? You know, going to put yourself, lock yourself away till he get here. Yeah. No, the, the Bible. Fearing right. to get something done because you think nope. he's gonna come. Mm -mm, nope. Yeah. I, nope. You know, that's yeah, what I, a lot of people uh, try to no, manifest out. Yeah, yeah. No, I believe you know what the scripture says that you know when he comes, the dead in Christ will rise, and we who are alive and remain. So I need to be working. Until I'm the dead in Christ, or if I'm alive, I'm gonna be caught up anyway. Yeah. So I need to be working while while he's while he's coming. Yeah. So that's just it. I just I just believe it's the right thing to do. I mean, I think that's you know, I believe that Jesus didn't just come to save us. He also came to be our example. Right. And we don't see Jesus hanging out. You okay. know, Jesus is working even when he went to a wedding. He still turns water to wine. Hey. Jesus is constantly working. He's and like constantly I tell doing. people, it was holy water. <laughs> I don't know. I think it had a little fermentation. Now, I'm a little real. I, you know, everybody's a wide. <laughs> Listen, Listen, you know, 14 years is an incredible amount of time yes. to have patience, to have sincerity, to be able to accomplish success. Yeah. You're going to be celebrating an anniversary yes. very soon. Why don't you yes. talk, talk a little bit about it? Wow. Okay. So, um, from May 18th to May 21st, which is really, really, uh, Thursday, Friday, Sunday, um, we will be celebrating my 14th anniversary here. Um, we kind of looked at, um, biblically, people look at the number seven as completion, you know, to God, seven days or seven days he rested, I would say, um, in terms of creating earth. So that's always the seven is the completion. So seven times two is 14. So we were kind of thinking of it like, you know, we're doubly blessed. You know, we made it 14 years together. Um, and, you know, there's the scripture, there's scripture that talks about how God will give you a double portion. So, you know, kind of being able to, to, do two cycles you know there, there's a literature out there about how that seventh year could be a real contentious challenging year for a pastor well guess what we've done it seven one time we've done it seven again wow. um, and we've enjoyed the journey together we've had our ups we've had our downs but most i mean literally as the song says all our, our all of our good days outweigh our bad days we've had far more great days here at, at smyrna than we've had challenges and it's just really been a blessing so um, on the Thursday night, we have a service, uh, Pastor G.L. Dixon, who, uh, you know, he and I are, are like big brother, little brother. As I said earlier, uh, we preach for each other for the balance of these 14 years. And actually, I, you know, since I started in ministry, he's always given me opportunity. So he's going to come and he'll open his, open up the anniversary. Um, we have a concert on, fr on Friday night mm -hmm. where um, Renata from Jersey City, who's like, She's a part of our district, our association, our state convention. She's like a daughter to me. She's going to sing a young man named Shakur, uh, Corey Fulmore, um, 
trying to think of all of the people. I hate to, to miss someone. There, mm-hmm. There's so many. Um, well, you could definitely yeah. go to the website. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, they're going they're to the website, it, like, Smyrna's my website, website, you know, yeah. my personal page. Exactly. Um, and then one of yeah. my just favorite local artists, Mietta, uh Stands with Farrar. It's just, it's a That's healer. Awesome. They are like yeah. amazing. So it's going to be a lot of Yeah, so a lot of, lot of beauty. A lot of positivity, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of energy. You know? um, Pastor Andre Coffey, who's one of like my brothers, okay. he's going to be the um, MC for the night. So a lot of, right. a lot of good, positive people, I a lot think of you, good, positive you're energy. I a very, very positive uh, minister who's going to be coming in from Fountain. Uh, oh, Baptist yeah. Church? And then on Sunday, um, <laughs> just an amazing, just, yeah, I mean, he's literally. At one point, was my role model for, like I said, Reverend Tebow was uh, teaching me how to be a a preacher and be a good preacher and understand the passion of the call. I was, a, but as I shifted to be a manuscript preacher and to see how do you present, and how do you convey your voice, like I looked to to Pastor Sanders as a model. Yeah. Um, and in recent years, we've become closer. Before, I was just kind of like the distant kid that just mouth dropped as I listened to him. Okay. You know, but now we've become closer, and so to have him come and share is just amazing. It's it's so humbling because he's just, I mean. And he's so awesome. I mean, he's like, I, I just, you know, he's one of those people that, you know, I just sit there and I listen. I try to say too yeah, much. No, good, you know, yeah. if he texts me on my phone, I'm like, oh, yeah, Pastor Sanders just <laughs> texts me. You know, I'm so excited because he's just done so much, you know, over 30 years at yeah. Fountain. Yeah. Um, so just to, and I also try to just still surround myself even as I get older with pastors that still have been doing it longer so that. I can still be nurtured and, and right. groomed and, and made better because I still have, I still feel I have so, such a way to go. You know, well, you know, I've been doing it for a while. You as know. an inspiration and hopefully as a major role model as we move forward, you have a longevity of opportunity ahead of you. Yeah. We're very proud of what you're doing in Thank the Christian you. community. We look Thank up you. to you oh, simply wow. <laughs> because of the fact that you are what we always wanted. Wow. You know, Thank I mean, you. God answers prayers. And, Thank you. you know, an old guy, just, I just hit my 60 mark this year. Oh, praise God. You know, wow. and, and, you know and I got to thank God, you know, after coming through heart surgery and all of the things oh, that many God. of us go through never know. at praise a certain God. age, I felt very inspired that you would open up the doors and allow me to have an opportunity to share with my viewers you, your personality, and Thank you the so fulfillment much. that you have in wanting to be better than you were before. Absolutely. Every day I That's have to so get important. better. Absolutely. Well, listen, uh, we thank you. Thank you. Okay. For especially for our anniversary. Be- no, it's not anniversary. This is our first time doing it. Oh, yeah. Inaugural. And, uh, yes. Yeah, inaugural, <laughs> right? So uh, we're going to transition. We're going to bring in our next guest. Uh, since this is Facebook, I'm not going to stop it. We're going to keep it going. Yeah, let's keep but, it live. Um, it'll be really... Uh, an opportunity that we will try to find a chance to have again. Oh, thank you so much. I would gladly do it again. My man. Thank you, sir. All right. All right. That's the John H. Gamble of Smyrna Baptist Church. Here in God Newark, bless everyone. New Shout Jersey. out to Smyrna. Shout out to Mary <laughs> P. Thomas Select Academy. Love you all. Shout out to the North community and all of my family and friends. Love you all. Keep praying. Stay blessed. Awesome. All right. We'll be right back. <laughs> 